An out-of-place artifact is an artifact of historical or archaeological interest found in an unusual context. Such artifacts may appear too advanced for the technology known to have existed at the time or may suggest human presence at a time before humans are known to have existed. Opart's definitive edition comprises an extensive list of artifacts that are considered out of place or time. This compilation of artifacts is in no particular order, nor does the archive judge the validity of the entries on the list. We are simply providing our viewers with the information, and you can make up your own judgments and determinations regarding these anomalous discoveries. Antikythera mechanism is an ancient Greek hand-powered model of the solar system and is the oldest known example of an analog computer used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance. It could also be used to track the four-year cycle of the ancient Olympic Games. This artifact was among wreckage retrieved from a shipwreck off the coast of the Greek island Antikythera in 1901. In 2005, a team from Cardiff University used computer X-ray tomography and high-resolution scanning to image inside fragments of the crust and case mechanism and read the faintest inscriptions that once covered the outer casing. They also discovered it had 30 meshing bronze gears enabling it to follow the movements of the moon and the sun through the zodiac. One of its many uses was to predict eclipses and to model the irregular orbit of the moon, where the moon's velocity is higher in its perigee than it is in its apogee. A portion of the mechanism is missing, and it is speculated that it calculated the positions of the five classical planets. The inscriptions were further deciphered in 2016, revealing numbers connected with the synodic cycles of Venus and Saturn. Much of the mechanism's design relies on wisdom from earlier Middle Eastern scientists. Astronomy in particular went through a transformation during the first millennium BCE in Babylon and Uruk. The Babylonians recorded the daily positions of the astronomical bodies on clay tablets, which revealed that the sun, moon, and planets moved in repeating cycles, a fact that was critical for making predictions. The moon, for instance, goes through 254 cycles against the backdrop of the stars every 19 years, an example of a so-called period relation. The Antikythera mechanism's design uses several of these Babylonian period relations. Considering that machines with similar complexity did not appear again until the astronomical clocks of Richard of Wallingford in the 14th century, the Antikythera mechanism stands as the epitome of an out-of-place artifact. Many of our viewers may not be aware that the film Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny features a plot around a fictionalized version of this mechanism. In the film, the device was built by Archimedes as a temporal mapping system and sought by a former Nazi scientist as a way to travel back in time and help Germany win World War II. In 1848, an archaeological expedition working in Egypt discovered strange hieroglyphs on a ceiling beam at an ancient temple in Abydos, several hundred miles south of Cairo. The hieroglyphs were carefully copied and brought back to Europe. The mysterious images gave rise to a heated debate amongst Egyptologists. Eventually, however, they were dismissed as bizarre objects that nobody could adequately explain and were forgotten. In the mid-1990s, photographs and videos taken primarily by tourists who had visited Abydos began to appear on the Internet. They depicted the strange machine hieroglyphs originally discovered in the 19th century. The temple in which they were found was built by Pharaoh Seti I around 3,000 years ago. To the modern viewer, it is clear that the strange machines that were so mysterious to the Victorians are in fact various types of flying craft and a tank. One of the aircraft is a helicopter. There's no mistaking it. It has a rotor blade, cockpit, and tail fin typical of a modern battle helicopter. On the face of it, this is one of the most astounding discoveries ever to have been made in Egypt. 
The Arab newspaper Al Shark Al Al Sat published several photographs taken at the Amun Ra Temple in Karnak. The photographs are of carvings also believed to be 3,000 years old. They appear very similar to the carvings found at Abydos. There is a battle helicopter with a distinct rotor and tail unit and nearby other modern looking flying craft. So, there are in fact not one, but two almost identical sets of carvings at Karnak and Abydos. Thus, the essential question is, what are the chances of that being due to identical pal impcest effects at both locations? Along the banks of the Murez River in Ayud, Romania, some 47 years ago, a crew of workers came across an object so strange some claim it is literally out of this world. It is unclear exactly what these workers were searching for when they accidentally unearthed two mastodon bones deep in the sandy shoreline. What we do know is that more than 35 feet beneath this location set something even more strange. An object that appeared to have no date, no purpose, and no explanation, which came to be known as the aluminum wedge of Ayud. What makes the wedge of Ayud so perplexing is the fact that it appears to have no age or function. The likelihood that a modern-day object would be found beside the bones of a beast that went extinct more than 11,700 years ago is slim. Adding to this is the fact that the object is covered in a patina, a coating that takes hundreds or even thousands of years to develop. Yet, it presents itself as modern aluminum, which is not believed to have been around at that time. Theories regarding its origins range from extraterrestrial visitation to complex preservation, but no firm explanation exists. Indeed, part of the reason this object has not been on display for over 50 years is the fact that historians don't know how to explain it to the public. Proponents of the ancient astronaut hypothesis have speculated that the wedge resembles part of a landing gear component that may have come unattached from an alien craft. The Baghdad Battery is one of the most famous artifacts of ancient Mesopotamia and is believed to be about 2,000 years old. In 1938, German archaeologist Wilhelm Koenig discovered a terracotta pot in modern Kujut Rabu, Iraq. The pot contained an electrical sheet and rod. Many researchers believe that the batteries belonged to the Parthian Kingdom, which had existed from 250 BCE to 220 CE. In 1940, after returning to Berlin because of an illness, Wilhelm published an article where he expressed his idea of electroplating. Unfortunately, because of World War II, his work went almost unnoticed. Then, in 1947, Willard F. M. Gray, an American physicist at the General Electric High Voltage Laboratory, created a replica of the battery. The engineer used copper sulfate as an electrolyte, and his replica produced an electric current of 1 to 2 volts. So, if these artifacts are actually batteries, does that mean Alessandro Volta was not the first to invent the electrochemical power cell in 1800? Where did ancient civilization get such knowledge? And for what purpose were those ancient batteries created? The experiments to which the Baghdad battery were subjected showed that it could generate a voltage between the electrodes of up to 5 volts. This suggests that ancient civilizations had quite advanced technologies and that they were not as primitive as we think. Archaeologists have found 12 Baghdad batteries. All of them had been kept in the National Museum of Iraq, but in 2003 they were looted. More than 15,000 exhibits, including the Baghdad vases, were stolen from the vaults and halls. The museum managed to recover some of the stolen goods, and some of the vessels can still be seen in Baghdad. In China's Qinghai province near Mount Beigong is a mysterious pyramid with three caves that lead to a saltwater lake. Local legend speculates that Mount Beigong is an ancient extraterrestrial laboratory. Under the lake bed and on the shore are iron pipes ranging from needle size to 16 inches in diameter and estimated to be around 150,000 years old. 
The rusty pipes reach from deep inside the mountain to a saltwater lake 260 feet away. Many of the hollow pipes are uniform in size and seem to be placed purposefully. The ancient objects are embedded deep enough into the mountain wall and floor to preclude modern human construction. What is baffling Chinese historians is that the area wasn't thought to have been occupied by people until around 30,000 years ago. And according to historians, the humans that were around were nomads, thus making it unlikely that they would have taken the time to install plumbing. Many researchers have argued that this site is evidence of paleocontact, and the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences isn't ruling it out. A researcher at the Academy told Xinhua News Agency the pyramid may have been built by intelligent beings. He didn't dismiss the theory that ancient extraterrestrials may be responsible. The investigation into the pipes began in 2002, with some researchers believing the pipes were left over by a prehistoric civilization whose techniques were later lost to the humans that moved into the area. Around the pipes leading to the area are strangely shaped stones protruding from the ground that are confusing historians even more. Scientists aren't entirely sure what they're made of. While the pipes are believed to be mostly iron, the head of publicity for the local government told reporters that the pipes were analyzed at a local smeltery, and 8% of the material could not be identified. The remaining material was a combination of ferric oxide, silicon dioxide, and calcium oxide, which are byproducts of a long interaction between iron and the surrounding sandstone. In 2007, it was discovered that some of these pipes also showed traces of radiation. One final theory is that they aren't even pipes at all, but fossilized tree roots. Fossilized tree roots of similar structure have been found in Louisiana, and scientists found plant matter in some of the pipes, and it looks very similar to tree rings. It's a long-standing geological theory that in certain temperatures and under certain chemical conditions, tree roots can undergo the transformation of soil into rock and in time produce iron formations. So were these pipes laid down by an unknown ancient civilization or possibly ancient astronauts? As of yet, there is no definitive answer. But one thing is for sure. This location directly contradicts the academic historical paradigm. The temple complex at Dendera in Upper Egypt was the cult center of Hathor, the ancient Egyptian goddess of the sky, fertility, women, and the mother of the sun god Ra. An inscription on a stone relief located in an underground passageway beneath the main temple has been a source of controversy for several decades. Some researchers have interpreted the inscription, otherwise known as the Dendera light bulb, as evidence that the ancient Egyptians possessed knowledge of electricity and actually had electric lights. Their theory has been dismissed by archaeologists and Egyptologists who maintain that the carving is a depiction of an Egyptian creation myth. At first glance, the inscription appears to resemble an elongated bulb and a wavy line inside that looks like a wire. The wire leads to a small box on which we see a deity kneeling. Next to the bulb, we see two armed dejed pillars connected to the wire-like object in the middle and a baboon armed with two knives. According to Eric von Dannigan, the carving is indeed proof of the existence of electrical lighting in ancient Egypt. Dannigan goes even further and suggests the snake served as a filament and the dejed pillar as an insulator while the tube itself was an ancient light bulb. The baboon is interpreted as a guardian who makes sure the device is not misused. For most Egyptologists, the inscriptions beneath Hathor's temple at Dendera are firmly rooted in Egyptian mythology. Despite this consensus among Egyptologists, some find the idea of the existence of ancient Egyptian electricity too exciting to give up on. According to them, the Dendera light has been a secret known only to priests who had access to sacred parts of the temple and performed rituals. As a part of the New Year celebrations, the priests in the temple created a small amount of light that would have emanated in waves from the serpent's body. In 1938, in a nearly inaccessible mountainous region on the borders of China and Tibet, 
a remarkable and perplexing set of discoveries were made that still mystify scholars and scientists today. In a group of secluded caves, ancient burials were discovered that contained strange humanoid skeletons only four and a half feet tall. The caves themselves were quite unusual in that they appeared to have been carved artificially into a series of tunnels and underground chambers. The walls of the caves are said to be squared and glazed like glass, as if cut into the rock using extreme heat. The caves were determined to be about 12,000 years old. The caves and the bodies buried within were discovered by a Chinese professor of archaeology at Beijing University named Chi Putai. In all, they found 716 graves containing strange diminutive skeletons. Adding to the mystery, in each of these graves they found a curious stone disc. Each disc measured about one foot in diameter and a third of an inch thick, with a round hole in the center of the stone much like a modern phonograph record or computer disc platter. The discs are engraved with microscopic inscriptions, or hieroglyphs, of an unknown origin that sit within two fine grooves that spiral inward from the outer edge of each disc to its center. The discs are carved with a very high level of precision from the hardest of granite. It is difficult to imagine that they could have possibly been carved with ancient tools. Over the years, many of the discs quietly disappeared into the black market and private collections, with a majority of them ending up in the Beijing University's archives. Local legend states that these beings were from a planet in the Sirius system. It also states that 20,000 years ago an exploration mission was sent to Earth and that a second expedition was sent to Earth 8,000 years later. During the second expedition, an accident occurred that destroyed their flying craft and the survivors were stranded, unable to ever leave Earth again. In the early 1970s, Russian scientists filed a request with the Chinese government to examine the stones, and several were sent to Moscow. Under examination, the Russian scientists were very surprised to discover that the disk contained high levels of cobalt and other metals. These materials are consistent with those found in iron core meteorites. Of course, critics questioned the authenticity of the Drupa stones, and with no photographic evidence of the cave, skeletons, and the actual stone disc, verification of this account is unlikely. In 1958, the Fuente Magna Bowl was found accidentally near Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. The site where it was found had not been studied for artifacts previously. The Fuente Magna is beautifully engraved in earthen brown both inside and out and bears zoological motifs and anthropomorphic characters within. A controversy arose about the cuneiform script on the Fuente Magna. Dr. Alberto Marini translated it and reported that it was Sumerian. But after a careful examination of the Fuente Magna, Dr. Clyde A. Winters determined that it was actually Proto-Sumerian, which is found on many artifacts from Mesopotamia. An identical script was used by the Elamites called Proto-Elamite. It is believed that the Fuente Magna was probably crafted by Sumerian people who settled in Bolivia sometime after 2500 BCE. The Sumerians used seaworthy ships that were known to sail to the distant Indian subcontinent. Some Sumerian ships most likely made their way around South Africa and entered one of the currents in the area that led from Africa across the Atlantic to South America and thence to the Pacific Ocean. They could have then searched for areas on the high plateau of Bolivia where food was being produced by the local inhabitants. They held the bowl in high esteem and were fastidious about its transport around the area. It should be noted that there have been challenges to the authenticity of the Fuente Magna by skeptics who suggested that it was a fabrication by archaeologists to gain international attention. The overwhelming support from the majority of the academic community should discredit this criticism, as it has in times past when challenges arose to the existence of any writing at all in the Americas. This artifact, known as the genetic disc, was discovered near Bogota, Colombia in 1964 and is estimated to be 6,000 years old. 
It is 10 and a half inches in diameter and weighs about four and a half pounds. Both sides are covered in illustrations of the development of a fetus in all stages. Nowadays, most of this process is only observed by doctors using special equipment. So how was this knowledge known 6,000 years ago? The genetic disk, also known as the embryonic disk, is made from lydite, a stone first mined in Lydia, an ancient country in the western part of Malaysia, which is on the other side of the world in the Indian Ocean. The stone is similar to granite in the matter of hardness, but it also possesses a layered structure along with the hardness, which makes it very difficult to work with. In fact, cutting something from it should have been impossible using the tools possessed by humans 6,000 years ago. The problem comes from its layered structure because it will automatically break open upon contact with cutting tools. And still, the genetic disc is made from this mineral, and the drawings on it more closely resemble a print rather than a carving. It is obvious that when the mineral underwent its treatment, a technique unknown to us was used. Its secret remains a mystery to this day. The illustrations on the disc are also a source of many questions. The entire process of the beginning of human life is illustrated on the circumference of both sides, including the purpose of male and female reproductive organs, the moment of conception, development of the fetus inside the womb, and the birth of the baby. On the left part of the disc is a clear drawing of sperm with no spermatozoids, and next to it one with spermatozoids. For the record, spermatozoids weren't discovered until 1677. This event was preceded by the invention of the microscope back in 1590, but the illustrations on the disc prove that there was presence of such knowledge thousands of years earlier. A fetus in several stages of development, which end in the formation of a baby, is illustrated on the upper part of the opposite side of the disc. A study determined that these really are illustrations of basic stages of development of a human fetus, and they can easily be identified. For now, no one can explain what kinds of technologies were used in the production of this object. From all the studies and discoveries, we can only draw the conclusion that it belongs to an unknown and highly developed civilization of the past. The Gata coin, also known as the main penny, is a very old coin that dates to the time of Norwegian King Olaf Kira, who reigned as King Olaf III between 1067 and 1093. One of the silver coins minted to honor his reign somehow found its way to the Goddard Prehistoric Archaeological Site in Brookline, Maine, almost a thousand years ago. It was discovered in 1957 along with some worked copper, pottery remnants, and other evidence of human habitation. The Goddard site has been dated by archaeologists to 1180 to 1235, and historians believe the people who lived there were the ancestors of today's Penobscot Indians. That means that this coin may have been used as metal currency in America some 500 years before the next New England silver coins, including the pine tree shilling, were minted. What was going on that this coin could have been left behind there? In the early medieval period, the northern hemisphere was warmer than it was later on or even now, and the Vikings were very active in exploring, attacking, and settling all over northern Europe, as far north as Iceland. They ventured to Greenland and then North America, where they colonized a part of Newfoundland in about 1000 CE. Archaeological evidence shows they were working with iron there. The Goddard site in Maine dates to approximately two centuries later, and this Norwegian silver coin was minted sometime in the interim. This site, located on the northern coast from what is now Nova Scotia, was part of an early shipping route. The Viking coin could have eventually circulated via their explorations and found its way into the hands of these Penobscot ancestors as a matter of native trade channels. The Vikings may have left North America by the time these Indians used the coin, but as we know, coins preserve history better than most human artifacts. The Maine State Museum, where it is now housed, describes the Maine penny as the only pre-Columbian Norse artifact, generally regarded as genuine, found within the United States. 
While the coin itself has been authenticated, its importance to human history and pre-Columbian exploration is not as clear because academia has run into yet another contradiction to its established historical timeline. Underneath Rockwall County and parts of Dallas County lies a mystery that has been debated by historians and geologists for decades. The miles of seemingly neatly stacked, often buried stone that sometimes reach 40 feet in height are intriguing. The existence of the walls was first discovered in 1852 when three locals were digging a well. Over the years, other similar formations have been found in the area, either already exposed or similarly excavated across a roughly rectangular 20 square miles of Rockwall County. From the beginning, scientists have claimed that the feature is natural, such as when geologist Richard Burleson in 1874 stated that the exposed sections he examined were igneous occurrences. Similarly, after he viewed the formations in 1901, geologist Dr. Robert Hill classified them as clastic sand dikes, while in 1909, Sidney Page agreed with Hill and described the feature as a number of disconnected sandstone dikes. Of course, even experts can disagree, and when archaeologist Count Byron Day Proroc examined a portion of the feature in 1925, he concluded it was man-made. Likewise, after architect John Lindsay studied the wall in 1996, he declared that evidence of a prehistoric structure built by man is mounting. Building on Lindsay's opinion, geologist James Shelton points to the fact that lintel portals and archways were documented along the walls, and openings on the wall that resembled windows or conduits for water have also been observed, as was a stone-lined passage that led to a vaulted chamber. A more recent analysis of a portion of the wall by forensic geologist in 2013 determined that the feature was made via fluid sand at depth rising up through fractures of the overlying hardened clay, and what looked like mortar between the stone blocks was actually sandy clay from the surrounding rock that had squeezed between the blocks. However, this potentially unknown ancient civilization could have used cast instead of cut stone, meaning a form of prehistoric cement was formed into blocks. After all, it is a well-known fact that other megalithic sites across the ancient world were similarly constructed of cast stone. The Ica stones were popularized by Javier Cabrera, a Peruvian doctor who received an engraved stone as a birthday gift in 1961. Cabrera identified the engraving on the stone as a stylized depiction of an extinct fish that lived millions of years before. Cabrera would go on to collect over 15,000 engraved stones over the next 35 years. Dr. Cabrera's library is organized by subject matter including physical and social sciences, ancient animals, geography, and prophecy. The stones depict a wide variety of scenes. Dinosaurs attacking or helping humans, advanced technology, advanced medical operations, maps, and sexual depictions. While there is a degree of ambiguity that leaves room for differing interpretations, they display definite knowledge of things that are wholly anachronistic. They have caught the attention of many people inclined to question aspects of modern science, and creationists and others have used the Ica stones to argue against prevailing scientific theories. They are a form of andesite, a gray to black volcanic rock, and a very hard mineral that would make etching quite difficult with primitive tools. Laboratories in Germany have authenticated the incisions that make up the carvings as extremely ancient. Nearby fossil finds indicate the area to be replete in bone fragments millions of years old. Unlike clay figurines that have organic material in their composition, there are no organic materials in plain old rock that will tell anything of its age. The surface of these rocks, however, has a varnish that is the result of bacteria and minute organisms which have adhered to them. A good black varnish or patina will take thousands of years to discolor and coat each stone. Etching these rocks would have removed the existing varnish revealing the bare rock. 
Since these rocks have developed additional varnish in the grooves, it seems likely that they were carved a very long time ago. The Russian UFO research group Kosmopoisk first announced discovery of the 300 million year old screw embedded inside a rock in the 1990s. And since then, mainstream scientists have struggled to explain it away as a natural phenomenon. The group conducts expeditions to remote sites on Earth in search for evidence of alien presence or activity and cryptozoological species such as Bigfoot or Almas. Cosmopoisk researchers found the screw while visiting the Kaluga region of Russia to locate the site of an asteroid impact that occurred in 1996. While searching for evidence of the fallen asteroid, the researchers found a rock that appeared to have remains of a metallic screw embedded in it. The screw measured about an inch in length. The researchers concluded that the screw was composed of metal. Geologists estimated the age of the rock to be about 300 to 320 million years. Evidence shows that iron atoms of the screw and the silicon atoms of the rock have in fact spread and fused, suggesting that the screw is by no means a recent addition to the rock. Additionally, X-ray examination of the rock found another screw was inside the rock. Based on only the photos, mainstream scientists have concluded the screw is very likely the fossil of a type of sea creature known as a crinoid that lived millions of years ago. In response to claims by some scientists that the screw is very likely the fossilized remains of an ancient crinoid, researchers said that apart from the evidence that the screw is metallic, it is different from crinoid fossils that have been found, being much larger. Predictably, while some researchers continue to claim that the screw is evidence of an ancient technological civilization millions of years old, mainstream scientists dismiss the claim. In June 1936, or 1934 by some accounts, Max Hahn and his wife Emma were hiking along Red Creek near London, Texas. It was there that they discovered an artifact that seemed completely out of place. What they found was a unique piece of wood protruding from a rock concretion. When the rock was broken by their son in 1947, it revealed an iron hammer with a wooden handle. The artifact would gain the world's attention when Carl Ball purchased the artifact in 1983. The London Hammer, or the London Artifact as some call it, was promoted by Ball as a monumental pre-flood discovery. Additional curiosity was generated when a 1985 report dated the rock formation encompassing the hammer at 400 to 500 million years old. The hammer is 6 inches long with a diameter of 1 inch. The metal has been identified as consisting of 96.6% iron, 2.6% chlorine, and 0.74% sulfur. This is certainly a unique blend of metallurgy which some claim to be a lost technology of ancient man. As with any mystery and grand claim, all the evidence needs to be presented before the truth can finally be revealed. The discovery of the London Hammer still leaves us with a lot of questions and there are many inconsistencies that prevent the scientific community from confirming this find as the oldest known artifact created by man. First of all, there are conflicting reports as to where the object was actually located in the surrounding rocks, and there is no photographic evidence of the object prior to being disturbed. One report states that the hammer was embedded in a rock formation dating to the Cretaceous period, which is 65 to 135 million years ago. But other accounts state that Mr. Hahn found the hammer bearing nodule near these surrounding rocks. Skeptics argue that minerals could have cemented the hammer around the Cretaceous rock after it was dropped or left behind. This could easily lead novice geologists to believe that the hammer and the rock formation are from the same time period. The only true method of determining the age of the hammer is through carbon-14 dating of the wooden handle. However, Ball has yet to authorize this procedure. The handle appears to be partially fossilized, so this certainly adds to the argument that this is a very ancient tool. 
but fossilization can occur prematurely through various natural methods. To skeptics, the hammer appears to be a tool that was abandoned or lost some 200 years ago, but to its supporters, this is a clear indication that man has been on this earth much longer than previously thought. The artifact is currently located at the Creation Evidence Museum. The Los Lunas Decalogue Stone is a large boulder on the side of Hidden Mountain near Los Lunas, New Mexico, that bears a nine-line inscription carved into a flat panel. The stone is also known as the Los Lunas Mystery Stone or Commandment Rock. The stone is controversial in that some claim the inscription is pre-Columbian and therefore proof of early Semitic contact with the Americas. The first recorded mention of the stone is in 1933 when Professor Frank Hibben, an archaeologist from the University of New Mexico, saw it. According to a 1996 interview, Hibben was convinced the inscription is ancient and thus authentic. He reported that he first saw the text in 1933. At the time, it was covered with lichen and patination and was hardly visible. He claimed he was taken to the site by a guide who claimed he had seen it as a boy back in the 1880s. The reported 1880s date of discovery is important to those who believe that the stone is pre-Columbian. However, the Paleo-Hebrew script, which is closely related to the Phoenician script, was known to scholars by at least 1870, thus not precluding the possibility of a modern hoax. Because of the stone's weight of over 80 tons, it was never moved to a museum or laboratory for study and safekeeping. Many visitors have cleaned the stone inscriptions over the years, likely destroying any possibility for scientific analysis of the inscription's patina. Nevertheless, comparing it to a modern inscription nearby, geologist George E. Morehouse estimated that the inscription could be between 500 and 2,000 years old. In April 2006, the first line of the unprotected inscription was obliterated by vandals. The Los Lunas Decalogue Stone is often grouped with the Heavener Rune Stone, Keniston Rune Stone, the Dykton Rock, and the Newport Tower as examples of American landmarks with disputed provenances. Other disputed American Hebrew inscriptions include the Smithsonian Institution's Back Creek Inscription, and the Newark, Ohio Decalogue Stone, Keystone, and Johnson Bradner Stone. This small clay figurine was unearthed in Nampa, Idaho in 1889. It was discovered from the 300-foot level of a well boring. The ancient sculpted piece shares a similarity with an upper Paleolithic female figurine known as the Willendorf Venus, which was discovered in 1908 in Willendorf, Austria, and dates back between 28,000 to 25,000 BCE. According to the United States Geological Survey, the clay layer in which the Nampa figurine was found is probably of the Glens Ferry Formation under Idaho Group, which is generally considered to be of the Pleo Pleistocene Age. Should the object prove to have been found where it was claimed to have been, this would date the artifact to around 2 million years old. George Frederick Wright, a geologist of the Boston Society of Natural History, visited the locality of the recovery site in 1890. Wright took it upon himself to compare the discoloration of the oxide upon the figurine with that of the clay balls which were still lying among the debris from the well. They were nearly identical with one another, or as close to the same as is possible. He reported in his 1912 book that there were patches of anhydrous red oxide of iron in protected places upon it, such as could not have been formed upon fraudulent activity. These confirmatory evidences placed the genuineness of the discovery beyond reasonable doubt. The official oldest known example of a depiction of a human being is still considered to be the Venus of Whole Fells an upper Paleolithic Venus figurine made from mammoth ivory that was discovered in 2008 in a German cave. It has been dated to between 35,000 and 40,000 years old. 
This makes the dating of the Nampa object at close to 2 million years old so anomalously ancient as to not be accepted by mainstream archaeology. So, is it possible that the Nampa figurine somehow slipped down from a higher level into the depths? Wright insists that such an idea can be ruled out by stating, it was impossible for anything to work in from the sides of the tube. The drill was not used after penetrating the lava deposit near the surface, but the tube was driven down and the included material brought up from time to time by use of a sand pump. The Nampa artifact is now on exhibit at the Idaho State Historical Society in Boise. Approximately 200 metallic spheres in size from 2.2 to 10 centimeters were found in a silver mine in Odessal, South Africa. They are estimated to be at least 2.8 billion years old and simply do not fit into any conventional prehistoric time scale. No one knows the purpose for which they were manufactured and most of all who created them. They were found in pyrophyllite, a quite soft secondary mineral but the globes, which have a fibrous structure on the inside with a shell around it, are very hard and cannot be scratched even by steel. According to the opinions of geologists, they are limonite concretions. Limonite is a kind of iron ore. Even if it is conceded that the sphere itself is a limonite concretion, one still must account for three parallel grooves. In the absence of a satisfactory natural explanation, the evidence is somewhat mysterious, leaving open the possibility that the South African grooved sphere, found in a mineral deposit 2.8 billion years old, was made by an intelligent being. If the spheres were artificially created and are of extreme ancient origin, then what could be their purpose? It has been suggested that they may have represented a sort of ammunition, a form of ancient records, talismans, information storage devices, or even a kind of extraterrestrial surveillance device. The Peri Reis map, a medieval era artifact, was discovered in a Turkish palace in 1929 and is dated to 1513. Yet, it shows a knowledge of faraway lands well beyond the areas European explorers had traveled and even shows land features Europeans couldn't have possibly known about in 1513, like the Andes Mountains of South America and the coastline of Antarctica under the ice. When drawing up his map, Perry Rees consulted as many as 20 other maps, some dating back to the time of Alexander the Great. Antarctica is more than 98% covered in glacial ice and snow. The continent of Antarctica was discovered in 1818, several hundreds of years after the Perry Reese map was drawn, yet it shows a landmass where Antarctica is. This, in and of itself, is astonishing, but there are more curiosities. The coastline of the landmass was unfamiliar and therefore deemed inaccurate for hundreds of years until 1961. It was then that Captain Lorenzo W. Burroughs, a captain in the U.S. Air Force Cartography Division, noted that the outline of the southern landmass seemed to accurately depict the coastline of the continent under the ice. How is this possible given the limitations of the surveying equipment in the 1500s? One theory is that the map was drawn using information on older maps that were made so long ago that it was before Antarctica was covered in ice. If that is the case, it is tangible proof of an advanced and much older civilization that predates known civilizations. The coastlines of South America and Africa, as shown on the Perry Reese map, are surprisingly accurate, within a half a degree of longitude. The equator is also in the precise location. Prior to 1790, when the marine chronometer was invented, sailors, navigators, and cartographers had no accurate way to pinpoint a given location, yet the Perry Reese map seems to have done that long before it was possible. Even if navigators did sail down the coast of South America, Africa, and Antarctica, the Perry Reese map should only indicate coastal features. Yet, the Andes Mountains of South America are accurately portrayed on the map. Rivers are even included. 
The inclusion of these land features means that Perry Reese had knowledge of more than just the coastlines of the continents on his map. The Perry Reese map is often exhibited in cases seeking to prove that civilization was once more advanced than our current understanding, but it is not the only anomalous cartographic artifact. A map of what was almost certainly Antarctica was created in 1531 by French cartographer Orance Finney, also known as Orontius Phineas. To even the most skeptical, the Orontius Phineas map is startling. Although it was printed in a book in 1531 and was thus not subject to subsequent amendment, it is remarkably like today's maps of Antarctica. Admittedly, it's too close to the tip of South America, and it is incorrectly oriented, yet the proportions seem similar and the coastal mountains found in the 1957 geophysical study are in roughly the right places and so are many bays and rivers. Furthermore, the shape of South America itself seems right, and the close resemblance between a modern scientifically exact map of the Ross Sea and Phineas's unnamed gulf is striking. Some experts claim these maps are proof that there were advanced civilizations on Earth at a much earlier date than known civilizations. Others claim that the maps show that continental movement occurred more recently than geologists believe. Still, others claim the maps are works of fiction and that it was dumb luck that it has proven to be so accurate. And, of course, there are many researchers who argue that the maps are solid evidence of paleocontact. According to mainstream archaeology, the pre-Columbian Quimbaya culture were believed to live in South America from 300 to 1550 CE and are best known for their precise gold and metalwork. Most gold pieces discovered are made with a Tumbega alloy with 30% copper, very similar to those accounts mentioned by Plato in his dialogues about the lost city of Atlantis. Among the intricate gold works are several types of insects and two devices that stand out to be aerodynamic in nature and shaped like no other insect known to exist. The ancient pieces look very much like the designs of modern airplanes and incorporate several features essentially proving the Quimbaya knew and understood principles of flight. Scale replicas of the Golden Flyer were built five times larger and tested precisely. Results from testing in 1994 proved these ancient, mysterious, airplane-shaped devices were capable of flight and actually flew very well without any sort of modifications using modern techniques. Modern researchers have mixed beliefs about the Quimbaya civilization and their presumed knowledge of flight on the gold artifacts. There are arguments regarding this theory over the lack of building materials necessary to make flying machines hundreds of years ago along with the absence of modern engines and that landing strips for the Golding Flyers have not been discovered. It's entirely possible for artifacts to be moved around from place to place in the ancient world, especially if they fell victim to a more dominant people or the cultures migrated for survival over time. The artifacts do exist, and they might help clarify another interesting ancient phenomenon not too far from where the Quimbeya once lived. Certain parts of the Nazca lines are believed by some researchers to resemble ancient runways. The golden airplanes could be evidence of an ancient culture's knowledge of flight well before modern times, or they could simply represent an extinct species of insects. In the great Indian epic of Ramayana, penned several thousand years ago, Author Valmiki speaks of a bridge over the ocean connecting India and Sri Lanka. The epic poem that stretches for nearly 24,000 verses narrates the life of the divine Prince Rama and his struggle to rescue his abductive wife Siddha from the demon king Ravana, the ruler of Sri Lanka. According to Hindu tradition, Rama lived during the Trita Yuga, a period of time that began 2,165,000 years ago and extended until about 869,000 years ago. In the story, when Rama's army reaches the ocean across which lies the island of Sri Lanka, the apes constructed a floating bridge across the sea by writing the name of Rama on the stones and tossing them into the water. 
According to the legend, the stones didn't sink because they had Rama's name written on them. Rama's army then used the bridge to cross the sea towards Sri Lanka. This strip of land was once believed to be a natural formation, however, images taken by a NASA satellite have shown this land formation to be a long, broken bridge under the ocean's surface. Dr. Badri Narayanan, the former director of the Geological Survey of India, performed a survey on this structure and concluded that it was man-made. He and his team drilled ten boreholes along the alignment of Rama's Bridge, also known as Adam's Bridge. What he discovered was startling. About six meters below the surface, he found a consistent layer of calcareous sandstone, corals, and boulder-like materials. His team was surprised when they discovered a layer of loose sand some four to five meters further down and then hard rock formations below that. A team of divers went down to physically examine the bridge. The boulders that they observed were not composed of a typical marine formation. They were identified as having come from either side of the causeway. The survey also indicates that there is evidence of ancient quarrying in these areas. It was concluded that materials from either shore were placed upon the sandy bottom of the water to form the causeway. The Saqqara bird is an artifact that was found in Egypt near the Saqqara Pyramid in 1898 CE. The artifact, which resembles a bird, has been the topic of many debates and many explanations. This interesting artifact is made of wood and is estimated to be about 2,200 years old. Though its shape resembles a bird, it more closely resembles a modern airplane with the head of a bird. Furthermore, the hieroglyphs on the model airplane read the gift of Amun, and three papyri found near the artifact mention the phrase, I want to fly. All these characteristics sparked Dr. Khalil Messiah, the physician who discovered the artifact in 1898, to speculate that the ancient Egyptians first made it as a model of an aircraft they either built or witnessed. He claimed that the Saqqara bird had aerodynamic qualities and that the only thing missing from the bird was the tail wing stabilizer with which it would have been capable of flying. To support his claims, Messiah built a balsa wood model and added the tail, proving the model indeed could fly. We know that the Egyptians built an advanced civilization and were experts in architecture, engineering, and art. Is it possible that this was a model constructed to create a flying machine? The papyri found next to the object, as well as the special characteristics of the Saqqara bird, would probably reject the naive opinion that it was designed to be a mere toy. Considering that the bird depicted cannot be found anywhere in nature, it is possible to imagine that the ancient Egyptians could have seen something in the air, perhaps some kind of flying machine that they couldn't comprehend, thus transferring the bird face to the object. Discovered by Egyptologist Brian Walter Emery in 1936 at Saqqara, the schist disk was uncovered while excavating the tomb of Prince Sabu of the First Dynasty, circa 3000 BCE. While uncovering numerous funerary objects from the site, Emery's attention was drawn to an object that he initially defined in his report as a container in the form of a schist bowl. Schists are a category of medium-grade metamorphic rocks notable for the preponderance of what are termed lamellar minerals such as micas, chlorite, talc, hornblende, and graphite. Derived from clays and mud which have passed through a series of metamorphic processes involving the production of shale, slate, and phyllite during the intermediate steps, most schists are mica, but graphite and chlorite are also widely found. Schist is characteristically foliated, meaning the individual mineral grains split off easily into flakes or slabs. Approximately 24 inches in diameter, 0.4 inches thick, and 4.2 inches in the center, the schist disc was crafted by an unknown method from this very fragile and delicate material, the production of which would confound many artists even today. 
Resembling a plate or concave steering wheel of a car, it has three cuts or curved shovels that resemble the helix of a boat, and in the center is an opening with a rim that seems to act as the outside receiver of some axis of a wheel or some other unknown mechanism, conceivably a central hub designed to fit onto a pole. Housed in the first wing of the Egyptian Museum of Cairo, the disc is currently labeled as an incense container, although there is no evidence or consensus whatsoever to support this assertion. What is certain, however, is that by this early time in history, stone carving was apparently a sophisticated skill far beyond what had ever been imagined. While most every archaeologist feels compelled to offer an opinion as to what purpose the disc served, its futuristic design continues to baffle any Egyptologist who has had a chance to study it at any length. Thus, a satisfactory explanation has yet to be provided. Adding to the mystery is the well-documented belief that the introduction of the wheel in Egypt didn't occur until the invasion of the Asiatic group known as the Hyksos at the end of the Middle Kingdom around 1640 BCE. Thus, the questions that arise are, if the schist disc is not a wheel, nor modeled after a wheel, what is it? How could a culture who typically used chisels to shape rock have mastered a technique to work such a delicate material to this extraordinary level? And perhaps most importantly, why would they invest the time and skills needed to create this object unless it served a very important, specific purpose? Be that as it may, the schist disc, which has been dated to at least 3000 BCE, continues to constitute one of the most perplexing Egyptian and ancient mysteries. Indeed, the schist disc is one of the best examples of an out-of-place artifact for those researchers who refuse to believe that such an advanced piece of technology could have been conceived and created without celestial help. Located in the Istanbul Archaeology Museum in Turkey is a sculpted scale model of what looks like a cone-nosed rocket ship. It appears to be powered by a cluster of four exhaust engines in the back surrounding a larger exhaust engine. The pilot is sitting with legs folded toward his chest and wearing a one-piece ribbed pressure suit which becomes boots at the feet and gloves at the hands. Since the pilot's head is missing, we cannot know whether the pilot wore a helmet, goggles, or other headgear. The artifact measures 5.7 inches long, 3.8 inches high, and 3.5 inches wide. Zechariah Sitchin, the leading authority and scholar on the ancient astronaut hypothesis, spent years tracking down the artifact until he located it at the Archaeology Museum in Istanbul. It was excavated at Toprikel, a city known in ancient times as Tuspa, where the kingdom of Ur-Artu reigned briefly over 2,500 years ago. The museum curators decided this small artifact must be a forgery because it differs from the era's style, and more importantly, it looks like a space capsule. However, during Sitchin's visit to Istanbul and the museum in September of 1997, he met with the director who took the artifact from a drawer and allowed Sitchin to examine and photograph it. It looked to Sitchin to be carved from a porous volcanic ash stone with very precise detail. The director asked Sitchin what he thought. It is not out of context, Sitchin told the director and his colleagues. When you view various artifacts that also seem to represent an ancient space-faring civilization, this was enough to convince the curators to finally put the object on public display. Al Ubaid Archaeological Site in Iraq is a gold mine that has yielded numerous objects from a pre-Sumerian time called the Ubaid period spanning from 5900 to 4000 BCE. Several Ubaid statues depict strange, lizard-like humanoid figures in unique, unceremonious poses that seem to indicate they were not gods, such as the animal-headed deities of Egypt, but rather a race of lizard people. 
The statues have been drawn into stories and theories of reptilian aliens that used to roam the earth and their true nature remains a mystery. The figurines are presented with long heads, almond-shaped eyes, long tapered faces, and a lizard-type nose. What exactly they represent is completely unknown. According to archaeologists, their postures, such as a female figure breastfeeding, does not suggest that they were ritualistic objects. It is certainly noteworthy that the serpent was a major symbol used in many societies to represent a number of gods, for example, the Sumerian god Enki, and the snake was used later on as the symbol for the brotherhood of the snake. The Ulf Birt swords are a group of about 170 medieval swords found primarily in northern Europe, dated to the 9th to 11th centuries, with blades inlaid with this inscription. In the Viking Age, the privilege of having a sword belonged exclusively to the elite because an Ulf Birt sword's unmatched strength could only be had at a high cost. The sharpness and durability of the blade made it possible to cut through bone or a lower quality weapon with one blow. The technology for making such swords was hundreds of years ahead of its time. The uniqueness of the Ulfbeert was the use of crucible steel with a high carbon content up to 1.2%. Before the discovery of the Ulfbeerts, it was believed that the technology for making metal harder originated during the Industrial Revolution. To do this, it is necessary to heat the metal to a temperature of 1600 degrees Celsius. This indicates that the creators of the Ulfbeerts were about 800 years ahead of the Industrial Revolution with their methods for heating the metal to make the swords. The inscription on the sword is located in the upper third of the dale of the sword and is generally about 4.7 to 5.5 inches long. The Vikings were among the fiercest warriors of all time. However, not many of them carried the Ulfbeert sword. Created by using a process that would remain unknown to the Vikings' rivals for centuries, the Ulfbeert was a revolutionary high-tech tool. It was also a real work of art. It is one of the artifacts that a few have heard of, yet its characteristics are incredibly interesting. This discovery was made in 1998 when electrical engineer John J. Williams found what appeared to be an electrical connector protruding from the ground on a hiking trip in North America. Williams refused to give away the exact location where the object was found, which has led skeptics to conclude that this artifact is just another hoax. But is it? Today, the artifact is referred to as the Petrodox, a device that has the undeniable aspect of an electrical component which ended up embedded into solid granite. It is not an accretion, concretion, pumice, or a fossil. It does not contain any known resins, cement, glues, adhesives, limestone, mortar, or other non-rhyolite, non-graphite binding agents. The component itself is about 0.3 inches in diameter, the pins of the device are about 0.1 inches high, and the spacing between the pins is approximately 0.9 inches, while the pin thickness is about 0.04 inches. Based on geological analysis, researchers believe the rock is at least 100,000 years old, something impossible if you believe that the object is of artificial origin. Skeptics firmly believe that this 100,000-year-old electrical component is a manufactured hoax, but Williams does not agree. He is convinced that he has found a genuine artifact that belonged to an advanced ancient civilization or an extraterrestrial race. Williams is willing to let researchers authenticate the artifact under certain conditions, that he is present during the analysis, and that the rock remains unharmed. In the 1930s, the United Fruit Company came to the Pacific coast of Costa Rica in search of new land for banana plantations. The company decided to clear land in the Daiki Valley, which is in the southwest region of Costa Rica. 
During this time period, a great number of mysteriously and seemingly perfectly shaped stone spheres were discovered in the jungle. The stone spheres vary in size from a couple of inches to six feet in diameter. The largest one found weighed more than 16 tons. To the naked eye, these spheres are perfectly round and smooth. When they were further examined by archaeologists and scientists using state-of-the-art equipment, they concluded that most of the spheres are not entirely perfect, but close. The stones are made from granodiorite, which is an igneous rock that is similar to granite. There are no definitive answers about these spheres. Since the mid-1900s, the stone spheres have been studied by scholars, archaeologists, and scientists, yet no one has been able to determine their origin. But there are a slew of theories. Based on artifacts found near some of the stone spheres, it is estimated that they were constructed between 800 CE and the 1500s. The balls were likely crafted by the native ancestors of the indigenous tribal groups that were present during the Spanish conquest. One theory speculates the spheres were constructed from existing boulders that were nearly round. Specialized sculptors could have then used a variety of methods, such as controlled fracturing to slowly remove layers of rock until the spheres looked perfect. The spheres could then be smoothed and shined, perhaps using sand or leather. To this day, no one really knows why these sculptures were created. Some believe they were a symbol of status or marked a tribal chief's property. Others think they were used for ceremonial or religious purposes. They may have also had navigational purposes. Many of them were originally found facing north. Before most of them were moved, many of them were located amongst other stone spheres and often created a shape or pattern such as a triangle, parallelogram, or straight line. One of the most astounding discovery in Tutankhamun's tomb was a 13-inch dagger made of iron and decorated with gold. The dagger had been discovered during the 1925 unwrapping of the mummy, but the age of the burial predated Egypt's Iron Age by more than 200 years. A preliminary non-destructive analysis performed in 1970 with x-rays showed high levels of nickel, suggesting that the dagger was made from extraterrestrial metal. In addition, the quality of the blade indicates that it was made using a type of fine crystallized metal as found in some types of meteorites. Before the development of high-temperature furnaces, meteorites were the only source of native iron accessible to early civilizations. Unable to fuse or melt the metal, the ancient blacksmiths hammered the pieces of meteoric iron into shape. But the origin of the meteorite used for King Tut's dagger remained a mystery. In June 2016, a paper compared the blade to an iron meteorite with similar proportions of iron, nickel, and cobalt discovered near and named after Karga Oasis. The dagger's metal was presumably from the same meteor shower. But some researchers noted that the chemical fingerprint didn't match exactly. A new study published in the journal Meteoritics in Planetary Science by researchers from Japan and Egypt suggests an alternative origin and locality. Chemical analysis shows a high concentration of iron, nickel, manganese, and traces of sulfur. The study also confirms the existence of Widman statin patterns on the blade, a unique pattern of intergrown metallic minerals found only in meteorites. The research concludes that the metal used to make the dagger comes from an octahedrite meteorite, the most common class of iron meteorites. The new chemical analysis alone doesn't provide clues where the meteorite originated. However, letters preserved on clay tablets found in Upper Egypt at El Amarna and dated to the New Kingdom between 1360 and 1332 BCE, coinciding with Tutankhamun's birth, describe an iron dagger given as a gift by the king of Mitanni, which is now Syria, to Egypt. It is not entirely clear if the ancient Egyptians knew of the extraterrestrial origin of the used metal. Texts dating to 1300 BCE refer to iron as a gift from the sky 
but this might be symbolic speech describing the rare and precious metal as a gift from the gods and so of heavenly origin. Perhaps the most fundamental component of the ancient astronaut hypothesis is the belief that the DNA of primitive man was manipulated by extraterrestrials to ultimately produce modern Homo sapiens. Whereas this was considered a fringe theory just a couple of decades ago, modern science has now embraced it. Scientists are now speculating that if extraterrestrials have left behind some hidden but decipherable proof of their existence, to test our intelligence and level of scientific advancement, they might have left it inside the cells of our body, that is, in our DNA. Researchers also believe the data holding the truth about our origins and our connection to alien life can be found by searching within. Robert Zubrin, an astronautical engineer, said the possibility of human DNA making an interstellar journey cannot be ruled out. Zubrin said that they would have been subject to high doses of both cosmic ray and ultraviolet radiation that would have limited its survivability. He said that out of the initial billions of bacterium cells sent, at least some would survive and get through, thus preserving the message in the process. Physicist Vladimir Sherbach and astrobiologist Maxim Makulov from Kazakhstan, believe humans have been genetically engineered by beings from another star system. They are of the opinion that the so-called beings may have visited Earth hundreds of millions of years ago, or they may have sent an information-packed signal into space that landed on Earth and triggered alterations in the human DNA. Once fixed, the code in our DNA might stay unchanged over cosmological timescales, the scientists declared. Therefore, it represents an exceptionally reliable storage for an intelligent signature. Looking deeply at the human DNA, Sherbach and Makalov say it seems as if it has been created with mathematical precision. Simple arrangements of the code reveal an ensemble of mathematical and ideographical patterns of symbolic language. It includes the use of decimal notation and logical transformations that are accurate and systematic, they explained. Zubrin posits that there is some sort of information in our DNA. He said there might be an alien code of amino acids just waiting to be unscrambled and decoded by humans. Indeed, an ancient and hidden extraterrestrial code in human DNA would be the most astonishing out-of-place artifact of all time.